All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome in. Welcome into our virtual Institute for Public Knowledge. Um, hello, Sarita. Hello, Sarita. Good to see you. Hi. Um, we're just waiting for folks to come in um, and settle in. It's lunchtime here in New York, so I hope um, if you're here, you have um, your lunch in front of you and are excited for this conversation. We're going to give it another 30 seconds for folks um, to come in as per usual, and then I'm going to kick us off. I hope everybody is enjoying um, spring, if you are um, on this side of, of the planet. It's been wonderful the past couple of um, days here in New York. And I see we're plateauing with our folks coming in and I take everybody has taking their seat. And that is my cue to formally welcome everybody. Welcome to another session in the co-opting AI series. I'm Mona Sloan, I'm a sociologist at New York University. I study technology and society. Um, I am convening the co-opting AI series, and this is only possible through very generous uh, support of, of course, the Institute for Public Knowledge, the 370J Project, the NYU Center for Responsible AI, and the Department of Technology, Culture, and Society at NYU Tandon. As always, huge thank you to all of the folks in the background who um, make this possible. Now, our conversation today is about a phenomenon or a social practice, depending um, on how you look at it, that I would argue really is infrastructural to artificial intelligence, and that is classification. Before I introduce a wonderful panelist and my terrific co-moderator, I want to acknowledge that I am currently standing on the unceded land of the Lanapi peoples. And I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lanapi community and perhaps the indigenous communities on whose land you may be located. And to commit to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism, especially in our institutions such as the academy. Now in our last co-opting AI event, which is about two weeks ago, we talked about the sudden pervasiveness of large language models that seemingly or magically are able to converse with us. But even those also agile uh, and also contextual systems are anchored by something that is, I think, innately human, which is the ever fluid practice of classification. In other words, even the chattiest of bots was birthed by the boring bureaucracies and information infrastructures that put things and people and situations into boxes and that allow us and machines to understand the relationship um, between information and what is going on. And as we're experiencing another huge wave in the AI hype, it seems very important that we not forget classificate the classification origins of AI um, and the ways in which it really continues to organize our quote unquote AI society. And this is really what today's co-opting AI event is all about, exploring classification practices, information systems, and the organization of society vis-a-vis -vis the AI hype. And I could not be more thrilled to welcome three eminent thinkers on issues around classification, around technology and society. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sarita Amruta, Dr. Dan Bauk, and Dr. Jeffrey Bauker. Um, Dr. Sarita Amruta will join me today as co-moderator. Hi, Sarita, it's good to see you here. Um, she is an anthropologist who studies race, labor, and class in global tech economies. She's currently investigating sensation and social movements in the Indian diaspora in a book project called Securing Dissent, Activism, and Cryptography in the Indian Diaspora. She has received many fellowships, amongst them from the Russia Sage Foundation to support the scholarship, and her most recent book is called Encoding Race, Encoding Class, Indian IT Workers in Berlin. This book is an account of the relationship between cognitive labor and embodiment, 
told through the stories of programmers from India who move within migration regimes and short-term coding projects in corporate settings. She has received awards for this wonderful book, for example, the 2017 Diana Forsyth Prize in the Anthropology of Science, Technology, and Medicine, um, and um, also the 2019 International Convention of Asian Studies Book Prize for the Social Sciences. Sarita is an Associate Professor of Strategic Design and Management at the New School and also an Affiliate Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of Washington. And she received her PhD in Anthropology from the University of Chicago. Hi, Sarita, it's great to see you. Sarita will actually moderate our panel discussion today. Um, but before she takes over, I would like to introduce our two wonderful panelists today. And beginning um, with a contribution today will be Dr. Joffrey Bauker, who is a professor at the School of Information and Computer Science at the University of California at Irvine. At UC Irvine, he directs a laboratory for values in the design of information systems and technology. And some of his recent positions include professor and senior scholar in cyber scholarship at the University of Pittsburgh I School and executive director for the Center of Science, Technology and Society at Santa Clara. I'm sure we all know that together with Lee Starr, he wrote the book, Sorting Things Out, Classification and in Its Consequences, which has been and continues to be hugely influential in um, technology and society scholarship. And his more recent book is actually on memory practices in the sciences. Welcome, Jaffe. It's wonderful to have you. Following Dr. Barker will be Dr. Dan Bauck, who is a an associate professor of history at Colgate University. And he tells me that he doesn't always have the best internet. So um, fingers crossed that this will work out today. Dan researches the history of bureaucracy, bureaucracies, quantification, and other modern things. And this is an important term for a Dan that are shrouded in cloaks of boringness. He actually studied computational mathematics as an undergraduate at Michigan State, and then he got a PhD in history from Princeton. His work is focused on investigating the ways that corporations, states, and other experts employ and have used, abused, made, and remade the categories that structure our daily experiences of being human. His first book, which is called How Our Days Became Numbered, Risk, and the Rise of the Statistical Individual that came out with Chicago in 2015, explored the spread into ordinary um, Americans' lives of the United States life insurance industry's methods for another important term, quantifying people, for discriminating by race, for justifying inequality, and for thinking statistically. He actually has a new book out, which is called Democracy's Data, The Hidden Stories in the U.S. Census and How to Read Them. Um, and this was actually one of New York Times 100 notable books for 2022. You can see that in the background, and he also just put it in the chat. In an age when we often hear that good governance requires that we depend on good data, it is crucial that everyone understand and can work to improve the processes that make data from people. Democracy's data is a history of the 1940 census that is designed to prepare its readers to examine and critique the data-driven systems that surround us. Um, Dan actually blogs about his work um, on the website called Shrouded in Cloaks of Boringness. Come And with that, a warm welcome to Joffrey, Dan, and Sarita, and I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Balker for a first provocation for today. Thank you. Joffrey, you're muted.
No worries, take your time. Hello, can you hear me now? Perfect. Right. Yeah, I'm so sorry about that. My Zoom suddenly quit on me. So let me um, share screen quickly if I can. Uh, slideshow from the beginning. Okay. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you so much, Mona, for the both the invitation, the kind introduction. And I'm so much looking forward to um, to the um, to the discussion today, for which purpose I'll try and keep my talk um, as fast as as uh, quickly uh, as quick as possible. Um, oh. Okay, when we look at AI and classification, um, oh, give me some messages. Sorry, look, I'm having problems. I need to go to another computer. Dan, could you speak first and I'll come on after you. Perfect. Hello, welcome. Uh, I'll be the Bauk before the Bauker, uh, since <laughs> that feels like it's appropriate anyways. Uh, let me just share my screen. In case it wasn't clear, I just wrote a book, so put it out there to begin with. Uh, thank you, Mona, for... Uh, Inviting me, I'm so glad to. I'm honored to be here with Jeff, who's been a long time, whose work uh, as a fellow scholar, one of the people who pioneered the study of really boring things uh, and created the Society of Boring Things. I'm glad to be a part of that. And Sarita, it's exciting to see you here. And in the audience, I see a lot of people who, who are old friends and people whose work I really admire. So, for the last few years, I've been thinking about classification in the process of thinking about the US Census. I'd like to begin with an illustration depicting the process of classification in the 1940 or depicting the census in 1940. So there on your right, you'll see people as they began the counting process as individuals. They wore hats, some of them have feathers. Then they joined into this massive procession in which their individualizing features start to fall away except for the occasional straight pitchfork carrier, like that person. At the end of this journey, they were, as best as I can tell, literally eaten by a mammoth book called the Population Census. All right, so this is a silly drawing, but it evokes for me what I think of as some of the highest and most noble and enduring purposes of data. The purpose of becoming part of something bigger than ourselves. The promise that we can understand ourselves better by seeing ourselves in the context of our communities next to our neighbors. As the Census Bureau told Americans in 1940, you cannot know your country unless your country knows you. So when I wrote this book, Democracy's Data, the 1940 census was the most recent count without any confidentiality restrictions. I could see everything, every response of every American to every question. It was a big modern data set, an important one, and remarkably open and transparent as well. I sought out insights into the American past and also into the history of data and how the history of the United States and data have been intertwined for a very long time. To Mona's point, right, this is not new, but rather, in fact, very old, deep traditions that build into our systems today. Now, it's easy to say you cannot know your country unless your country knows you. It is much more difficult to describe how a census works out the method of knowing each and every, uh, each and every one of over 100 million people, and then turns those particular instances of knowing into a series of social facts. So I want to use this illustration to sketch out how that happened in 1940. So first, let's add a census sheet. Before anyone could be counted, 
there had to be a method for counting and a set of questions and categories coming from Washington. The officials who designed the census sheet made some consequential changes in 1940. They, for instance, removed Mexican from the list of acceptable races, largely because of pressure from Mexico and from Mexican-American activists who were discovering the danger of being classified as anything other than white in the Jim Crow South. Officials in DC also added a question asking for each American's yearly income from wages. This was information that was desired from, by business, labor, and by the fledgling welfare state. So next, an army of census takers carried these sheets across the country with a goal that's pretty audacious of trying to count each and every American once and only once and in the right place. In 1940, that meant sending out about 120,000 enumerators to find over 131 million people. This is a stamp that the 1940 census used to advertise the count. Note the very simple imperative, cooperate, which to our ears, I think sounds hopeless as a slogan, but times were different. So now let's imagine sending out uh, all of these enumerators in their guise as Uncle Sam to around the country as they move forward to try and talk to everybody. The data gets unruly. It got unruly at this stage. People said the darndest things, and enumerators made the strangest judgments. It's just really difficult to reduce the complexity of our world to a data set. The Census Bureau trained their enumerators extensively. It tried to standardize their behavior. But just a glance at the Bureau's training materials reveals how tricky that was. So I wanted to take you all through virtually a little training exercise here. I need you all to cooperate with me, even though I can't tell that you're doing it. So here's a question. Mr. Simmons was born in Warsaw when it was part of the Russian Empire. After the World War, this is World War I, this city became part of the Free Republic of Poland. In 1939, it came under German control. What country, we're in 1940, remember, what country should be entered as the birthplace for Mr. Simmons? So your possible answers are Russia, right? He was born in Warsaw and was part of the Russian Empire. Poland, it was in the middle, it was Poland. And then Germany, Germany is what controls it in 1940 during the census. So now I, on your, on your, we can't use the chat, so I just need you on your own right now to write down what your answer is, Russia, Poland, or Germany. I'll give you a moment to make this a very important decision. So hopefully as you're doing that, you're starting to think about some of the uncertainties that are baked into the process of trying to figure out even something so seemingly straightforward as where were you born? In this case, even though at the time of the 1940 enumeration, Mr. Simmons's birthplace was controlled by the Nazis, and even though at the time of his birth, it was part of Russia, the correct answer was Poland. So congratulations, all of you out there who chose Poland, which based on my experience was not very many of you. We have no idea how Mr. Simmons conceived of himself or would have used a fictional character, and that didn't matter to the Bureau. American geopolitical commitments to Polish independence mattered more. Now, once they were trained, this army of Uncle Sam stand-ins made their rounds, but they were far from uniform in how they saw and immortalized their fellow Americans. For instance, across the Southwest, we find evidence of some enumerators, but not all, marking people as Mexican by race. That's that MEX you can see right in the middle category there, the middle column there. Even though that category was explicitly forbidden. In marginalized communities across the country for a variety of reasons, some enumerators, but not all, labeled a substantial number of people as partners to a head of household in the, with whom they were living. Variation was the rule in census taking. Now, the third stage of any data set involves cleaning the wild and woolly responses that came in from the field. This phase sought to reimpose order on the data set. In 1940, this phase involved rooms filled with workers like this one. Washington, D.C. and the government was racially segregated, and this was a room filled with African-American editors. Some of them were likely responsible for crossing out every Mexican racial label and replacing it with the code for white. 
a woman, a worker like this woman, then punched information from census sheets into paper punch cards. On those cards, every person who was labeled a partner disappeared and instead became a lodger. And then those cards were counted and assembled into statistics by a factory filled with workers using these mechanical tabulators. A press release from March 1940 dubbed these devices a huge battery of mechanical robots. Each of these processes involved imposing control. They were meant to generate fixed and certain seeming numbers. It was a huge task, as this schematic diagram from a 1940 bureau official suggests. Some office workers must have felt overwhelmed by the piles of information they had to process, like this poor official. In the final stage of a data set, the results were published and released to the world, where once again chaos would break out as people interpreted the facts and made a riot of judgments and drew widely varied conclusions. So classification suffuses the story. People with power try to shape the acceptable categories, then those charged with counting and being counted subvert those categories, expanding them in the process. The gathered data are cleaned to reimpose order, but only for a little while. This is not just how the census works. I think it is a basic model for how all personal data systems work. It should at the very least remind us that prescribed categorizations and published classifications are not the only ones that exist, either in the world or even in the data system itself. And that means that today's big data problems cannot be solved simply by adding more data. So uh, Emily Denton and collaborators, I think Razvan is actually in the room here too, one of the authors of this paper on genealogies data sets, uh, noted the power of a logic of accumulation in which it is believed that, quote, larger and more diverse data sets will, in the limit, converge to the mythical unbiased data set. They note how this belief benefits data monopolists most because they're the ones best situated to gather more data. I think the story of the US Census makes clear that in many cases, more data won't get rid of the underlying and inherent uncertainties. They will always be there. I see at least two things to do once we recognize the data systems by their nature, employ unstable categories and describe individuals in multiple ways throughout the course of the making of data. First, we need strong privacy and confidentiality protections. To make good aggregate numbers, we need to categorize and classify, classify individuals. But those categorizations are seldom fit for making decisions that would actually affect a person's life. Privacy and confidentiality protect our data systems and protect people from the ways those data systems misrepresent them in their particulars. And second, we need to continue to develop tools for presenting data and numbers in ways that incorporate uncertainty measures and make those measures work, make them efficacious in decision-making processes. It, acknowledging the mess that lives within our data systems is not a reason to abandon them or what we can learn from them. It is a reason to admit that politics and judgments will have to play a role along with the data in determining how we best translate data into action. Thank you. Thank you so much, share. Dan, for, yeah, for stepping in and welcome back to Joe. Um, I hope all is well if you want to take over. Great. Okay, great. Thanks so much. And uh, I loved what I heard of Dan's, <laughs> Dan's talk, and hopefully I'll pick up some more from the conversation afterwards. Um, I, I will dock myself a minute or two for the uh, mess up at the beginning, so I'll get through this fairly quickly. Um, the way in which AI is often presented to us as if in one model that's used is the data refinery model. We just ingest all this data, push it through the computers, and then somehow magically um, actionable knowledge about the world exists. Um, and basically what I'll be doing in this talk is arguing against that sort of model. The first thing is just, you know, what should be the fairly obvious point, that classification never goes away. Um, there's often this rhetoric about AI, 
that we're moving out of this um, top left model of market segmentation, where you try and um, classify and cl classify into all these various groups and then work out what the um, values of those groups are. Classification still occurs within all machine learning. Um, and the bottom right is an example of uh, you know, kind of a clustering algorithm for classification in machine learning. Uh, so it never goes away. It just gets buried in ways that we can't see. And the ways in which we can't see it are often uh, highly, um, highly, um, highly politicized. Uh, Anya Beckman uh, did this wonderful study a few years ago of Facebook and uh, automatic, uh, automatic recognition um, on Facebook. And she found that uh, these two images were automatically tossed out by the Facebook algorithm. First of all, because guys don't hug babies and stay close to babies. That's just wrong. So it had to be a mistake in the data. So it didn't exist. Similarly, women don't, um, women don't uh, chug beer out of bottles. Of course they don't. Uh, so again, the women are automatically excluded from that data set. So what might seem to be an automatic and wonderful you know, facial recognition process is already highly inflected uh, in terms of classification systems. Um, Another point here is that classification is always political. And I love this case from um, California uh, last year, that bumblebees can be classified as fish under California conversation, uh, conservation law. Um, what this means is that you want California bumblebees to act in a certain way. Um, so the way in which you get them to act in that way is to, is to classify them as fish. And we often forget all of those workarounds that are present in almost all classification systems in one way or another. Um, when Antonia Walford did a brilliant study of the Internet of Things and, um, and um, in the Brazilian rainforest, uh, she showed basically three things. Um, first is what should be, I think, an obvious point, but maybe is not, is that every, um, uh, every field in a database is always already a classification. Um, so just because, you know, you've got these automatically, uh, automatic databases from streaming data doesn't mean that you're avoiding the, the work of classification. And the second and fairly vital point, this is sort of a, similar to the point I was just making about Facebook, is that um, things that were believed to be impossible that couldn't exist were excluded from the, were excluded from the streaming data. So it wasn't streaming data to data refinery to knowledge, it was streaming data to scrubbing the streaming data to, uh, to knowledge. Uh, I can go on more about that um, in the end if necessary. Um, another point is that classification systems, um, this is the idea of talk, T-O-R-Q-U-E, um, it's everybody loves in science. Um, if we can count the biodiversity research, climate change, if we can count the number of species in the world, um, and if we can <laughs> define things in terms of species, then you can get lots and lots of you know great intelligence about the world. Um, but we forget that the um, classification systems are built they're largely around mammals, largely around us. Um, and they don't really work for fungi. In fact, many people say that we shouldn't be classified, trying to classify fungi in terms of species at all. Um, and so again, the choice that's being made about the dominant classification system uh, is, often, is often a mistaken one. Very similar points can be made about genetics and AI. Um, so if classification systems in artificial intelligence are uh, socially and politically inflected, then I think we need to look at who's producing these systems. Um, and I loved it, you know, this guy, Jürgen Schmidhuber, about whom I know virtually nothing, um, but it's referred to as the dad of mature AI, the papa of famous AI projects, the father of modern AI, the father of AI. Um, and if you actually look at women's representation um, in STEM, that science, technology, uh, education, and medicine fields over the past um, 30 odd years, the only area in the STEM fields where there is less participation from women um, is in computer science. So these artificial intelligence programs and these algorithms are largely being developed 
by white males. So it's rather unsurprising, um, as Paul Owen points out, that we keep get or Latonya Sweeney as well, obviously, um, that we keep getting these um, um, you know, racial and genderized classifications out of AI when you look at who's creating them, who's creating the field. Um, so somewhat in summary, uh, it's a lovely article by David Lear and Lear and Paul Ohm where they argue that machine learning algorithms are the complex outputs of, um, of intense human labor. Um, they uh, labor from data, from scientists, from statisticians, analysts, and computer programmers. From the moment they conceptualize a predictive task to the moment the running model is deployed, they exert a significant and articulable influence over everything from how the data is cleaned or how, to how simple or complex the learning process is. Uh, so again, just because the classifications are buried and the work of producing the classifications are buried within the systems doesn't mean it's not happening. Um, and a final point here is that we tend to, the way, in, going back to the original slide, we tend to assume that infrastructure is, you know, smooth and operating. You, you know, you flip a switch and suddenly you get a, you know, electric, let there be light. Um, but in fact, the work of producing infrastructure and the in infrastructure work, especially of AI and classification in this context, is inherently messy. And recognizing that messiness is, I think, core to us developing a politics moving forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeffrey and, and Dan, um, for this. And I'm going to toss it over to Sarita for the panel discussion. Wonderful. Thank you so much to both of you for your provocations. They were really um, amazing in the sense that that uh, I'm just going to use first names. I hope that's OK with everybody. But Dan's went really deeply into a specific process of classification, classification, but of course, can stand in in a general way for classification in general. And uh, and Jeff really took us through some of the larger implications and problems drawing on, I could hear kind of echoes of your entire body of work and what you presented <laughs> today. It was very nice, it's a nice overview. Um, maybe I could start us with a discussion about this point that both of you raised about the way that classification gets hidden. Um, and I was really struck, Dan, in that first image you showed of the people being consumed by the giant book, right? It's a very Lilliputian sort of moment. Um, that juxtaposing that image with the, with the image of all the people and the processes that in fact stand in, in the pages of that book for what happens to the data. Um, and then Jeff, in your presentation, speaking very much to the fact that classification seems to be more hidden now, than it ever has been. I wonder if either of you have some comments on how we got to this place in the current moment in which the classification systems, for instance, that uh, of the British colonial government in India or the apartheid regime in South Africa that we, we could relatively easily surface or in the 1940s census when that material is available to public view. It's no longer kept private. We could read through that. How do how did we get from those moments and classification projects to the current moment in which it seems very hard to uncover the classificatory schemas that are behind, or even the data sets that are behind generative AI projects? Dan, do you want to start? Dan, you start. I'll start if you want, but you start. All right, I'll start. Um, <laughs> okay, thanks for the thanks for the generous uh, commentary. Um, okay, a few points. I mean, I think we need to look at the deep history of this. And for me, one of the core concepts is governmentality by by Michel Foucault. Uh, where, if you look at the origin of the word statistics, which Dan will know much better than me, it's, you know, it's information about the state, and it's all about how to make people and things governable, um, and that's why these classification systems um, become so important. Uh, the question of why they become buried, um, well, and partly it's technology, I mean, partly it's a, obviously just a straight technological answer to that. But secondly, and I think more importantly, is that classifications become more powerful and people become more governable. 
um, the more that you hide the classifications, the more that you fold them in to the processes that are being used to classify. So there's a myth about AI right now. So, you know, we don't classify anymore. Um, you know, we're just taking information about the individual and we're pushing back, say, in music recommender systems, um, just what you yourself alone like. Um, and I think it's really important to recognize that, you know, that hidden work of classification um, in the medical field, this is calling classification from N equals one, where you're trying to produce personalized medicine for every individual on the face of the planet. Um, that hidden work of classification um, gains its power from the very fact that it's so well hidden, from the very fact that it's so well folded in, which is why we need education systems which really bring out those social aspects of classification. In a sense, that's already done for the more obvious, you know, visible classifications, but it's almost never done for the invisible classificatory work. I love, I love that response uh, and the question. And I'm gonna kind of think a little bit loud in front of everyone here. So uh, forgive me. Uh, in Ian Hacking, in his uh, Avalanche of Printed Numbers article talks about how in, in, in unexpected ways in the 19th century, st statistics that were produced to try to solve social problems, to look at groups that were considered to be prob problem groups, social groups that might cause problems, then were picked up. The categories that were produced by government states were then picked up and used as ways to mobilize by those people who were being classified. So like very famously, uh, Les Miserables is initially a like column before it's a uh, blockbuster play uh, musical right um but in a novel somewhere in between there and a way of thinking about people but so like I wonder if there's a way in which in the 19th century uh, people who created classifications started to learn the danger of their own operation that mm -hmm. by producing categorizations and making them public they were also creating means by which those who they were intending to control might organize themselves and start to exert control within that existing system. And so that suggests that there might be a value in then trying to find ways to obscure one's categorizations. And you see that, again, from the 19th century, the, the life insurance companies have scoring systems, which they use to make it look like they're giving individualized numbers yeah. to each person. And then having done that, they then, this is to Jeff's point, the classifications never go away. They then ultimately still classify people into one of like four groups that the, in which they use to determine what kind of contract they're going to give you, what kind of premium they're going to charge you. But it looks like they're personalizing things. And so we still see today this rhetoric of personalization, I think is, a, is often explicitly as a way to obscure the acts of classification that either people might resist or that could be used to build group solidarities. Yeah. And maybe just to build on that a little bit more, I was, I've been really struck in the conversation around generative AI, how absent classification has been as a point of worry. So if we look at Hinton's reasons for stepping back, or this morning, Steve Wozniak was on the radio proclaiming the dangers of generative AI. Um, and he in a way has seems to have just discovered capitalism and he was bemoaning the fact that profit motive would trump regulation um, of AI systems. So I'm wondering, so sort of a two-parter, two-part question. One, um, if you both as experts in classificatory systems were to pen an op-ed or, or join the fray in the discussion of generative AI, how would you bring <laughs> how would you bring uh, this question of classification back into attention? Is it something that, um, in your opinion, has been ignored to our peril? That's the first part of my question. And then the second part of my question would be precisely about uh, the move, or maybe it was always there, the entwined relationship between governmentality as a process of managing populations by states and classification, classificatory systems as it plays a role in managing consumer desires or managing labor 
in a political economy that also, after all, very much depends on class classificatory systems. Dan, do you I'll, want to I'll, yeah, sure. I'll jump in really quickly on this one. I'll, and I'll start with where Jeff started his talk, which is that I think if you write that op-ed, the beginning is by saying we. I don't really know anything about generative AI, so I'm just going to tweak your question and talk about AI systems more largely. Um, the, the the most immediate threat I see is the way in which we will, as we have been now for decades, use these systems for, to do what to create what Ted Porter would have called mechanical decision criteria. That you will input a data into a system, it will then you turn you turn the algorithms crank. And it spits out a decision about what you will do, uh, what how a person will be treated, what their credit score is, and whether or not they get a loan, uh, any number of these kinds of possible choices, who gets admitted to college and on what grounds, uh, access to opportunity, access to healthcare, who gets access to any of these number of really like high stakes things that really matter to us. And that the, the trick here is that because of the ways in which these systems are built around rhetorics of personalization, in which they seem to be saying, oh, we're doing something different. We're treating you pre precisely and separately. It obscures the actual work, which is ultimately turning people into categories of like those who are accepted and those who aren't accepted, those who are in and those who are out, those who are considered high risk and those who are considered not high risk. And that those categorizations and classifications are ultimately the things that matter most. But we have this, this rhetoric and this claim that somehow we're avoiding it and that that's the dangerous thing. Yeah, that's that. That's great, and I fully agree. Um, just a couple of couple of other quick points. I mean, one is, I mean, I've, I've worried for years about how do we deal with this issue, and we do not deal with it as outsiders. Um, like I come from the field, you know, partly of history and philosophy of science, where no scientist will read philosophy of science, and very few scientists will read history of science and or social studies of science. We're talking with each other. Um, we're not talking with the scientists that, um, that we're studying. And that's why for many years, um, Helen Nissenbaum at NYU and myself um, ran a series of uh, workshops called Values in the Design of Information Systems and Technology, where we tried to bring together the social scientists with the practitioners, with the engineers, with the designers, um, actually, and, and the organization theory people as well, and just get them growing a culture together. And I think that's one of the things looking forward, that's the only solution I can see, um, is that we do not act, um, you know, we from my field don't act as outside cr critics of the system, that we become part of the system and we demand a right to be part of the system. So that's, that's the first point. <laughs> the second, um, this is just a uh, point um, came across a few weeks ago that I love is that, you know, we often talk about computers and the intention, the attention economy, and the attention economy is, you know, how much, you know, we, you know, we, we read Google ads, how much we follow, uh, you know, which apps we follow when um, on the internet, but you can invert that and say artificial intelligence is spending an awful amount of time um, vesting its attention in us. Um, we are studied in ways that we have never been studied in history before. We're studied on an ongoing basis in ways that we have never been studied before. Uh, so again, that you know, the, what it means, what AI attention means is I think a central question for our times. Thank you, and I'm, I'm going to uh, return our attention to the second question, which is about the relationship between governmentality and political economy in the development of classification systems. Um, I'm not quite sure, I mean, Could you expand on, I'm sorry, could you expand on the question a little bit? I mean, sure, like... sure. So I was just thinking about the discussion we've been having about, about why classification systems get buried and this really pro provocation about uh, the relationship between forms of classification and the ability to organize through ca the categories, the very, very categories of classification itself, um, which seems very compelling if we are 
in a sense, staying within the domain of states and governmentality. But of course, um, there is an, a, a, an entirely different but equally powerful realm in which classification is extremely important, which is in the classification of workers and consumers. Mm -hmm. um, yep. and, and I'm wondering about how we can also get our theoretical uh, apparatus to take into account both of these forces or, or how would you approach understanding the current moment? I mean, is it, do you believe that we've sort of moved from largely governmental classificatory schemes to ones that are developed and run by private companies for the sake of shaping consumer desire? Is it a mix of those? How do we account for both of those things in, in our analytical framings? Okay, that, no, that's a wonderful, wonderful question and observation. Thank you. I mean, the, you know, I guess two points. I mean, one, I'm, I'm going to make the William Gibson um, neuromancer point to start with, which is that, you know, the state is really not where politics is happening nowadays. Um, you know, to adopt the the Guy Debord um, phrase, you know, we're, uh, you know, or, you know, Baudrillard was great on this. We're living in the society of the spectacle. And the spectacle is not created by the, it's not created, um, it, you know, it's not developed by the state. Uh, you look at the important po political work that's done nowadays, it's done by the multinationals, it's done by the companies that um, that own and um, deal with our attention on the internet. That's where the economy is, that's where the decisions are being made. Um, so I really think that, you know, it, it, it's not a case of, um, in this sense, it's not a, a case that the state has gone away. I think exactly the same uh, theoretical points can be made, um, but it's what we used to call the state is now very much the um, very much the remit of um, large multinational corporations. It's very much the remit of um, entities dealing with the relationship between the you know the the computer. Um, sorry, the, the relationship between people and the economy, um, and again. You know, dipping back into the the deeper history of this line, um, there's a one. Well, it's a problematic but wonderful book by James Benninger called The Control Revolution, and one of the points he makes there is the it's the development of feedback and control mechanisms during the 19th century. First of all, out of industrialization, um, but also through the developing of uh, large scale advertising in the 1880s and 1890s uh, with Quaker Oats actually was the first. Um, that societies of control um, basically started to develop outside of state mechanisms, I would argue, um, probably in the mid to late 19th century. Yeah, and I and I because I, I would think of a series of two as like that there are like sedimentary layers um, or like a, that it's like a palimpsest that we're dealing with when we're thinking about the political economy and in, in terms of government vitality and that the so the, so the, it, I think it is true that there was a, an earlier phase in which much of the work of data and statistics and classification went into producing large scale categories. And to your point, like thinking about the way the British Empire created modes of identity and ways of thinking about people that then persisted and persist to this day in then shaping how people see themselves. And that has not gone away, right? So we, I, it would be silly to claim that just because Google exists that, uh, right, to think about the way that Barbara Fields writes about racecraft and the way in which states and capital capitalist actors are producing ways of thinking about bodies and race in the late 18th century that also doesn't go away those things persist but on top of it then we start having competing modes too i think uh that are i think not not governmentality I think there are different kinds of governmentality yeah. that are instead run by states and that instead presume to try to like that are more fleeting uh that attempt to obscure the ways in which they do classification something like that Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Can I just add in very quickly the reference that I've thrown into chat there to Kate Crawford's wonderful book, The Atlas of AI. And a lot of that book is, is devoted to 
you know, what are the training sets that originally used in face recognition, for example? And she traces lots of the classificatory work that's done in AI right back into the 19th century in a, in a continuous fashion. Yeah, that's very, very helpful. And I think it's, you know, from my point of view, it's really important to keep our analytical eye on the inflection points or intercalcations of corporate um, corporate AI models that seem to address our deepest desires or, or needs for efficiency uh, and how they, in fact, pull into them very long histories of classification and, and therefore become open to manipulation in ways that uh, might be better predicted if one keeps this longer history in mind. Um, maybe a last question for me, and then we'll turn it over to the Q&A, which has been very, very lively. I wanted to pick up on Dan's point about the second point, the second suggestion about tools of representing data that allow for messiness um, as a really important way to, in fact, unearth the political fact of classification in knowledge systems. And I'm wondering if either of you have come across good examples of this, maybe especially in reporting. I can just think of many examples in uh, reporting and data that have not done that, but I would love to hear from either of you if you have examples that, that are top of mind of, of uh, projects that try to allow uncertainty to come through in the way we represent data. So, I mean, I I'll, 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 before before hopefully Jeff has a good answer to this, but I will say um, the I, mean, to, I throw that in there in part because this I'm increasingly coming to believe this is one of these things where to Jeff's point we really need to be working with people who are doing this work very directly and get ourselves into these systems to figure out how to do this. Um, I at Colgate many time many years ago that we when I first got there the student evaluations of teaching were all just handwritten comments, open-ended, responding to a few different comments. And then about four or five years into my time here, there was a move to add onto those Likert scales. And the like my single contribution to this entire thing, aside from saying no over and over again, was to meet with people and confer to like just be sure that whatever happened, there would never be a number that was produced by this. That all we would do is get visualizations of distributions of responses, but never single numbers because of them would convey the sense that there was uh, some precision in what was happening that was entirely undue. And I thought, all right, well, this is a tiny victory, but that was not like a good result. It was just like a, a less than bad result. And I, and I know that like one of the reasons this is so important and so difficult is that the trick is to figure out how to get people with power and in governments to be willing to accept and work with these things about uncertainty. So when I remember in the archives running into this case where a one of the first social security board actuaries produced a series of projections for the board saying, this is like a low, medium, high set of projections. And they essentially wrote back and said, why are you trying to destroy this institution uh, by giving us multiple things? We need a number what's the what is the prediction going to be because we need to use that to make this decision you giving us all this uncertainty is just undermining the entire project and so it's a it's just like it's actually a really naughty problem that involves not just working with technical people but also working with the institutions that are making decisions to try to convince them that they can in fact take uncertainty and use it i mean i guess maybe the, the final thing i'll say um I was talking to somebody at the Department of Commerce once about this, and they asked, like, what well, does anyone know how to deal well with uncertainty? And it's and at that moment, like talking to them, like, oh, yeah, of course, weather, like NOAA does, like the National Oceanographic uh, and um, whatever the A stands for, other administration, right? Like they know how to do with this. And they've, in fact, that's the one, that's maybe the, the place to look to really figure out how you get uncertainty baked into really good systems for figuring out how to deal with stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's that's such a great, again, such a great intervention. Um, I guess, first of all, I'd, um, I'd refer to a book I love um, from a legal scholar, Brian Highcourt, uh, which is titled Against Prediction, um, which I think is a really valuable resource here. Um, but 
generically, the representation of uncertainty and dealing with uncertainty. Um, I'll, I'll go back to an old case on this, that um, it's, it, 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 it's impossible to trace HIV AIDS um, through old medical databases. Um, and the reason for that is that that's not the way in which classification systems worked in those days. We didn't know about, you know, uh, retroviral, um, um, you know, uh, retroviruses. So there was no way in which, you know, we could code for that data. So one suggestion that was offered within the medical community um, was, and, and this is the same for those of you in library and information science, it's the same as Ranganathan um, was suggesting uh, aspectual classification as a term he used, that what we do is we, in, instead of storing a set of categories, uh, what we do is we store a set of aspects, descriptions of the data, um, so that in the AIDS case, for example, you would store alongside the cause of death and the proximate cause of death, which is basically what's on the death certificate, you'd store alongside what other conditions occurred, like Kaposi's sarcoma, for example. So you're not avoiding classification by that kind of trick. What you're doing is you're postponing the classification to the last possible instant. Um, and I think that that's sort of the way forward for me has always been, how do we, you know, we, we, we'll never get, we can't work with that, we can't live without classification, but how do we postpone it till the very last instant so that if we want to rejig it, if we want to change the way in which we understand the world, we've got the flexibility to do it rather than legacy classifications which get so deeply, deeply buried. Um, my favorite example of burying that well, which I'll do very quickly, is in, is in climate science. That um, in climate science models, um, as uh, Paul Edwards points out, uh, many um, climate scientists don't know the models um, that are, don't know the social values and the uh, and the and the guesses which are laid deep, deep within the models that they produce. So they're quite often producing models which are self-contradictory to the way in which they think about the world. Um, and, you know, I think that's, that, that, that's really core cool there is to build up that, that recognition. Thank you so much. Mona, do you want to take the q and I, yeah, very happy to. Thank you so much, Sarita, for this. Um, Great panel discussion. Thank you, Dan and Jeff. We have a very active audience, which is always wonderful. So I'm going to delve right in and bring in my dear colleague, Ellen McFarlane, with the first question um, who talk, uh, about trauma. Um, and Alan says, the matter of trauma for what one discovers is even looking at census data is not really addressed. The love affair with AI for some is equal to how companies that promote access to your data as being a beautiful exercise and yet become a trauma filled experience with no one to turn to at the company. Dan, I'm going to toss this to you, please. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the, I guess I, I could imagine the encounter with census data is traumatic at a number of different levels, right? There's there's a, a the moment of actually encountering a census sheet is often a quite fraught moment. Like this came home to me as I was researching this book because I ran into Langston Hughes' poem, Madam and the Census Man, in which he talks about and thinks through the way in which his protagonist, Alberta K. Johnson, is trying to get herself enumerated and yet finds that she has lost that capacity to say who she is and to be enumerated in the way she wants to be named uh, by this census taker. And so like we, many of us, I think people, I would kind of watch this during the 2020 census, the way that people as they encountered the census questions felt a lot and often not necessarily good things about the ways in which they had to be uh, right, like to, to, to take something that Jeff might say, like torqued uh, or like twisted and to be fit into this category and have them their lives be shaped by that that act of being fit into the classification system. So there's the, the moment of the actual classification that pr produces trauma. And then, yeah, there's the point of then also looking back at seeing uh, maybe things we didn't expect to see, looking back and seeing historical categories that now carry with them a the sense of, like in 1940, a very clear sense in which the United States is built around an assumption of white supremacy, which is built into those racial categories. And those things come through too in reading that data. 
Thank you for that, Dan. I'm just going to stay with you for another question that I think relates to that from Abby. And they are asking, do you have favorite examples of people refusing, counter-categorizing, or otherwise subverting attempts to capture them in flat categories? Mm. Um, I mean, it comes from all political persuasions and like if we think of a right left spectrum uh one of the things that's interesting is how consistently both the right and the left fight for privacy protections and against forms of categorization classification uh, often for different reasons um so people fought against exposing their income information and that could come from the very rich who fought to have a uh, a, a big bucket category essentially they didn't have to tell an enumerator how much they made they said we make more than five thousand dollars and everyone else who made less had to say very precisely how much money they made so that's a kind of resistance from the rich there's a form of resistance from people who were uh against essentially fdr's new deal and they came out and said we don't want to explain our income and a lot of that was about resisting also not just the New Deal, but resisting having to release their their information to their neighbors, who they very reasonably maybe didn't trust or didn't, who would be coming through and asking these questions. Uh, and then there's forms of resistance in which you see people uh, refusing to maybe answer a question exactly the way that they want to, to answer it. So during the 2020 census, I would often in, um, spend time on Reddit and Twitter watching people post their responses to things. Uh, and one of the places we often saw that was around uh, sex categories, gender identity categories. I mean, it, it's a sex category and it's 2020 census. And so people especially would sometimes insist on using a paper form so that they could write in one of the, the one of, something that wasn't one of those two options, uh, which is otherwise not allowed by a computer form that will give you only two possible options. They insisted that they were going to write something on top on, on this piece of paper. And the move towards computer systems is, a, I think, sometimes a means of trying to make it a lot harder to subvert a form by, for instance, just writing anything else you want separately on it. Thank you, Dan, for that. I appreciate it. Sorry, Jeff. Uh, go, go ahead. No, just, just a very quick point on that. I mean, I, you, you remind me, Dan, there of um, um, Monica Casper and other people's work on the intersex community um, that, you know, Many people, a fair percentage of people, not huge, but are, but are born with both sets of rep, uh, reproductive organs. And typically what's happened in the past is that um, doctors decide at birth which set you're going to keep and which set they're going to suppress. So it's actually, you know, with the power of the scalpel, they're enforcing a classification system. You have to be this gender or that gender. Um, and I think that that's been a really interesting political movement and really interesting political resistance over the last 10 to 20 years has been trying to get rights and recognition for the intersex community, which is still not there as far as I know on the census data. Thanks for that. And I um, actually have a follow-up question from Sarah on this um, about um, the negotiate, you know, the need to negotiate or call attention to the absences and flaws of data without risking that folks might dismiss the data outright um, for being too flawed. Jeff, if you could maybe take that one. Um, yeah, if it, yeah. I mean, it's so interesting. I mean, I, you know, I was, I was reminded during Dan's last response, and I hope this is responsive to your to your question, um, Mona, but do correct me if not. Um, you know that um, there's a political role um, for being for strategic essentialism, for saying that you belong to a category that you don't actually believe in. Um, you know, I do that all the time, you know, you know, I'm basically, you know, you know, I get identified as a certain, you know, I get identified within a certain category and it's very hard for me to escape it. And sometimes I will marry the category because it's useful for me to use that category to deploy it. Um, other times at the same time, what I want to do is deny the category and say the category is bullshit. Um, so that's what I always, that, that's the kind of mix that I believe is the kind of mix we need going forward is how to simultaneously marry the category when you need it, then deny it at the same time in the same breath. 
Um, and it's very, very difficult to do. Yeah, I, and I, I take, uh, I mean, certainly I see that. And in, in the census example, it was, it was very interesting talking to activists who are often fighting with one another and within themselves trying to think about, for instance, whether or not one should check multiple race categories, knowing yeah. that the, what will often happen in that case is one will they will be clumped in many tables under two or more races and not appear as in either in any of the other individual single race categories, thus in some ways removing one from the count. And so people strategically might choose one of these categories for political purposes. This is how I think I want to be counted to make sure that the state sees me in my community. Um, but I mean, it's the, the other thing about um, the, what I think would be, I think was Sarah's question you said was, again, thinking about Paul Edwards' example, thinking about climate change, right? One of the, the constant concerns is things like climate gate and that by releasing information that makes clear the mess behind data sets we rely on, we will make it easy for people then who want to sow doubt to sow further doubt or who want to undermine our data systems to undermine our data systems. And to Jeff's point earlier, we in fact need classification as a society to survive. And we want to, to like face big problems like climate change, which involves then having to acknowledge this. And I guess my theory here is that then the response is not the response is essentially inoculate is, is a kind of model of inoculation by actually, in fact, spending a lot more time talking to people about how data systems are actually made. And that it, that the more in which we can convince large swaths of the population that it is perfectly normal for good data to be messy. And in fact, to Jeff's point that like throughout, that it's not a single process, but in fact, the data is constantly changing throughout and that it produces reliable numbers. And that's fine to then go and show that the things that get, that produce those reliable numbers also had other irregularities in them. That's just like how data is made. That then that actually can build up maybe some resistance, some capacity to deal with exposures like climate gate. Yeah, could could I just build for, for for a second on the climate gate example and and, and climate change? Because I've gotten into some trouble with folks like Paul Edwards and Bruno Latour about this. That essentially, you know, Bruno and um, you know what Bruno used to say, what Paul does say, is that we have you know don't you know take off your social studies of science hat. You need to believe this data. Um, even though, you know, the 1.5 degrees is a completely meaningless statistic. Um, it's sort of important in policy terms because, um, you know, that's what the policymakers will respond to. Uh, and I'm, I strongly believe that we need to keep questioning the data. And it's not a question, you know, what we need to do that is educate the public and educate people around uncertainty in data and not try and say, well, this data I really, really believe in. That's just, that for me is always wrong. Thank you both for that. And um, I appreciate the conversation sort of veering towards the question how we all sort of leverage classification for political purposes, um, you know, whether there's refusal or engagement or in policy um, circles. And I am actually, um, kind of um, using that as a cue to ask a question that Joseph put in the chat. And um, I'm going to um, ask you, Dan, and then I have another one for you, another one for you, Jeff, um, which is, Joseph is wondering whether you have thoughts on how to best advocate for the proper use of classification in the public sphere through highlighting harms of improper categorization, for example, or something else. Dan, if you could take that one. Hmm. Yeah, the be right, it's proper use of classification in the public sphere. Um, yeah, I don't know, it might be a dodge to say uh, that, and, and it's thinking about the distinction that Sarita was drawing earlier between governmentality and the way in which states and corporations come to be involved. I, I think the, I'm not the right person to say what a good category is in most situations. There's a few categories around which I have some, some strong opinions and experience that I can build. And so I tend to look to communities who 
do in fact know like how they want to be identified and who have an, some sort of experiences or a way of thinking about like this is what's really important and so i trust both that like we should be thinking about who are the organized groups that are capable of exerting pressure on states exerting pressure on corporations and essentially insisting right you you will only make categorizations about us as long as you've first in real meaningful ways collaborated with us in creating the system and so that but that then fundamentally also points down to just saying that the response to like how to do categorization better is to spend a lot of time insisting on more democratic process and on greater regulation of the people who actually do most of the categorization so like a lot of what we need to be doing is actually just as general people voting and organizing around greater regulation of the people who do categorization mm -hmm. so basically social interaction and, and participation in society by way of acknowledging that you know classification is something that's the social practice that allows us to do that um jeffrey i have a question for you um and the question is can you say more about the slippage and classification from descriptive to normative, how does the historical work of classification to norm or improve or eliminate its subject's figure in how we should understand the perhaps insidious production of classification in the present? Yeah, that's great. Um, in a sense, I don't have a good response to that because I, 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 yeah, I find it very difficult personally to distinguish between normative and um, normative and objective forms of classification and I think you know there's always a degree of normativity baked in but that's that's not that's not really a good answer to the question so let me try and develop a little bit uh, a little bit more on that um, it's right let's let's do an example that's that's um you know, that comes from Latonya Sweeney's work um, it, uh, about metadata and the work of metadata. If you look at um, medical data, you know, she draws a beautiful map somewhere of all of the different entities that are trying to make use of that, you know, one particular data set. And, you know, it basically comes down to hundreds of different entities that have their own specific needs for that data. Um, and I think that, um, the shift to no, a shift to normative often occurs when databases and classification systems are being used outside of the world that they were being that, that they were being created for. Um, there's um, reminds me, and this is maybe a somewhat convoluted point, but it reminds me of a point that was made um, that we made several years ago about um, cyber infrastructure and um, sharing data across the sciences, which is way, way harder than you'd think. Um, every, you know, every particular science tends to know what the uncertainties and problems are with their data. However, the other sciences tend to import the data and import the classification systems and believe them. Um, and, and that's massively a problem. Um, you know, so I think that, you know, that's, um, that's absolutely um, an area for, for future work. Um, and by the way, just um, for the end, I draw attention to Razvan's absolutely lovely comment about the aporia in the Q&A. Yes, thank you so much um, for pointing that out. I have a last question for all three of you uh, to close this off. And Caitlin Petrie, who's also a wonderful and very smart thinker, um, says, given that there are so many significant lines of historical continuity between past manifestation of classification and current ones in the AI age, Caitlin's question is, what do we not yet know that we need to know? Is there anything happening currently that our existing analytical frameworks for understanding classification and social counting, for example, governmentality, struggle to make sense of? Where do we need new theoretical frameworks and conceptual tools? And Sarita, maybe you can take this one first and then Dan and then Joff, and then I'm going to close us off. Oh, that's such a good question. I can't believe you've asked me to go first. Um, <laughs> for me, some of 
of the new the theoretical tools or, or frameworks have to do with, um, well, I don't know how new they are. I mean, br bringing in perspectives from outside Europe and the US, I think that's still not really happening enough in our discussion of how these systems are developing, how classification changes, and what kind of, if, we, if we're interested in an analysis of power, uh, what kinds of new actors are emerging on the scene that have networked power or agency that's neither the state nor capital? I think for me, that's a big area that needs to be developed further, but that's a very <laughs> provisional thought here at the end, but it's a great question. Yeah, it is a great question. And um, let's... <sighs> Let me build a little bit on the example of biological classifications and classifying entities in terms of species. Species generically are not a very interesting category, but they're the category that's most amenable to, to computerization right now. It would make a huge difference in the world if we could classify by relationship. Um, the world exists according to symbiotic relations. I mean, that's the flora, 90% of the cells in your body are your flora and fauna. Your relationship with the world is central. We don't yet have, I don't think, any good tools for classifying and dealing with the centrality of, of the relation rather than the centrality of the entity. Every classification system comes down to entities, and I think that's a huge problem. Uh, yeah, and I'll just I'll close off. I mean, one just by echoing Sarita, like one of the interesting things is thinking about how the history, we talked about governmentality, but then post-colonial scholars are equally important in trying to think about, in my own thinking, about like how a census works, like that one of the ways in which I could see what the U.S. census was doing was by looking at post-colonial scholars talking about censuses and be like, oh, all right, I see what's happening here now. The To answer this question about what we don't yet know, I think that maybe a theory of data of of what, how data is made is something which I, I keep trying and struggling for. And so right to Jeff's initial provocation that we, the data refinery model, I follow something a little bit like that in, try, in my own talk, trying to figure out like the step process, the, the press process through here. And what I, what I want is a way of trying to help people understand that like the, the table that is produced that we think of as the data is in fact, just one part of the life of a much larger thing which is actually what the data is and the data is just as truly the data in its wild and woolly phase as it is in that tabular static phase so for me like i've been inspired kind of by uh, karen barad's meeting the universe halfway here uh, as a as a way for trying to think about what's happening in data systems more generally that it's about like the cuts you make that determine what's the data at any given moment. But in fact, the instrument is much more complex. But I, but I have yet to find a really convincing way to try to explain that theory in a way that it can take hold. Thank you for that. So new, new actors, relationality, and the life of data are great points, new avenues that we all need to explore. A huge thank you to Sarita Amruta, Jock Bauker, and Dan Bauk for a terrific conversation today on classification. Lots of gratitude to you, also to our wonderful audience. Um, there are many more questions in the Q&A. I want to acknowledge that we didn't get to all of them. But the good news is that you can find our panelists and Sarita online um, and reach out to them with more questions. Um, I also want to invite you to our next and last of the semester co-opting AI event on May 23rd at 5 p.m., which will be related. It will be on AI and origins. Um, and here is the link. I will be hosting um, Stephanie Dick, uh, Kevin Driscoll, and Chris Wiggins, who just co-authored a book called um, How Data Happens. So I'm very excited for that. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of the week, a terrific weekend, and I look forward to seeing you all very soon. Thank you so much. <laughs>